Awesome. Welcome, everyone. Not a bad day to kick off the day, talk about tokenomics, gaming, and I have a smoothie, so uh, not a bad way to go and start the day. Um, I'm pretty excited to actually have this panel because I work at the gaming team on a Ava Labs. So to think about tokenomics, game design is a big part of uh, our job. And so I'm excited to have the panelists up here. We have a really, really nice group of people. Um, we have uh, Nick Meltzer uh, from uh, Shima Capital. We have Francis uh, from Shrapnel. And we have uh, Bolin from DFK. We have Lisa from Economic Design. I'm gonna leave it to you guys to actually introduce yourselves briefly. And then let's jump right into the questions. The goal of the panel is to talk about economic sustainability. What is, it, what is a good token structure? Uh, and figuring out, you know, how do you actually build a really good open game economy? So, yeah, why don't we kick off with you, Nick? What's going on, everybody? Yeah. yeah. Let's get some excitement going on in here. All right. First talk of the day. Uh, yeah, my name is Nick. I'm a venture partner with Shima. Uh, I've been a game designer my entire life, literally since the age of four. Uh, and I've designed games in every medium, so I'm excited to bring uh, a lot of gaming perspective um, to the blockchain gaming industry. Um, yeah. Uh, Francis, i am not been a game designer my entire life. As they said, former aerospace engineer, did a lot on the systems design and architecture like that. Uh, currently head of economy at Shrapnel, so. Hello, I'm Bolon. I have also not been a game designer my entire life. I'm also not an engineer, uh, but I am the director of player engagement for Kingdom Studios, which makes DeFi Kingdoms, um, as well as being on our tokenomics committee, uh, bringing the community perspective to that decision making. Hi, I'm Lisa, I'm from Economic Design and I'm an economist. So we design a lot of different economy of the games. So not just the gameplay where we take a lot of insight from there, but turn them into economic metrics and macroeconomic and microeconomic structures to incentivize people to behave in a certain way in the games. Awesome, yeah. So I think, I think the best way to start this off is let's just get a level playing field of what does it actually mean to incorporate Web3 into games, right? Like what does it actually mean to have an open game economy how does that flip the model of Web2 games? Um, I'm, this is gonna be kind of open-ended, so I kind of wanna, you know, anyone feel free to jump in, but I, I, wanna, I wanna hammer out, like, what does it actually mean to incorporate Web3 uh, into a game, and what is an open game economy? Uh, let's start there. Um, who, who, who would like to take it, Nick, or? Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll jump off here. So, coming from Web2 mindset, um, designing an economy in an, amount, in amount, in an MMO, uh, was one of the hardest problems in game design. It was continually uh, referenced as one of the hardest problems, um, and we, <laughs> we added another layer of difficulty on it uh, by making it open. And basically what that means is anybody, anywhere, can trade in and out of the economy. Um, and with that kickoff, I'll jump it to somebody else. Yeah, I think uh, typically when you're looking at an MMO economy, you're trying to use various economic levers to incentivize people to perform various actions. And having it where they can actively think, oh, if I do this, that is worth 20 cents, that is worth $2. It makes it a lot more difficult to drive certain behaviors and also can be quite dangerous because people are actively losing money. Uh, so if you don't protect people uh, in a more deeper way from you know, potential loss, uh, they can churn out a lot faster because they're actively seeing, hey, my account balance is going down. And it's not just, hey, this is fake in-game gold now. It's like, hey, this is real dollars that you're playing with. Yeah, I think just to build off that a little bit, not only the protection side, but also just the anticipation side of trying to predict what demented things might happen in the open economy, uh, it definitely adds a layer. Uh, there, there's a phrase that I like to use, and I mean it with all respect, but never underestimate the degen. If it can be done, it will be done. And so just keeping that in mind and being able to ante anticipate behaviors that you never would have thought would happen because they will. So I'm coming from an economics perspective. And one of the biggest difference with open economy is that there is a very obvious extrinsic value, monetization value, financial value, to a lot of these fungible, non-fungible tokens and assets in place. And what does that mean? It drive, at the end of the day, economics is all about the incentives and disincentives to drive different behaviors. So you're shifting a lot of behaviors just from the interest and love of playing the game to the kind of 
financial output, the financial returns, the ROI, because you can measure that. And when you can start exporting and importing game A to game B, which is interoperability that we talk about, we're not there yet, but this is something a lot of people are talking about, that changes the framework a lot. So now, instead of just deciding we'll make the best game ever, we're going to make it fun, everyone's going to stay in the game, and everyone is just going to... We're going to have a very solid macro structure system design to make sure people stay in the game. Now you have a substitution effect, because there's another, a better ROI in another game. And I only have 24 hours in a day. So how do I balance between that? When we talk about sustainability, economic sustainability, it's not just designing a solid game that's self-financing, but also the substitution effect of the macro market, the macro market structure, not just within the game, but in the game industry. I, you know, I think it's like really, really exciting with uh, open game economies because you start looking at like Web two game economies. You know, like World of Warcraft. I'm a, I was a big fan. Uh, it was a really. There's so many interesting studies about World of Warcraft with the game economy there, and there was like inflation with the gold, and there was you know uh, a lot of assets that were maybe farmed more than others because they had more value, and their bots and all these other things. And like all these things are concerns in Web two, uh, um, in the Web two uh, kind of vertical, and now you know as you kind of open up the game economy, there's a lot of maybe even criticism about Web3 game economies. And, um, you know, I want to get into the token structure thing soon, but just to maybe highlight, uh, you know, all these business models are going to be changing a lot uh, as you incorporate, you know, tokens, uh, revenue generation, NFTs, all these other amazing things. Um, how, how, how are enterprises or, you know, what's like the pitch to enterprises uh, when you talk about maybe incorporating, you know, Web3 into a business model, right? Like, how does that actually change? Because, you know, there's, uh, there's free-to-play, there's, you know, subscription models, there's, you know, all these different ways of uh, making money as a game developer. How, how is open game economy going to actually change the way businesses, like game developers, think about generating revenue? Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm going to leave that open. And then and I also then want to dive into, like, token structures and all these other things after this question, but I definitely want to highlight that first. Yeah. I'd be happy to kick that off. Uh, I think that Web3 will finally be the death to microtransactions, which I think we can all be very excited about because nobody enjoys them. But when you incorporate real world value into the assets in the economy, you no longer need those microtransactions because the revenue is built into what the player is doing. So rather than getting them to pay 99 cents over and over and over and over again for more lives or you know whatever your free to play model is, it's already built in. The player's using gas for each transaction they submit, a portion of that is coming to the developer. Uh, with you know DEXs, a portion of the DEX fees is coming to the developers. With NFTs, the aftermarket sales, a portion of that is coming to the developer. So the, the revenue generating portions are built directly into the economy. So rather than making them additional microtransactions and trying to convince people that they need to spend this 99 cents over and over, it's just built into the gameplay itself and part of the actual game loop. You also get access to like new forms of retention. Like at the moment, you know, gaming used to be you pay sixty dollars, then it went to free to play, and now we can actually start giving players tangible value assets. Um, so it, it, you can reduce player churn massively, and you can make players feel a lot more involved in the ecosystem by giving them free things, uh, which which I think is probably the best benefit in terms of a game design aspect to having an open economy is that you can now reward players that typically spend large sums of money on your game and you can actually keep them in your game for longer and you can make them feel more involved. Yeah, two good points. Um, something I want to touch on is a little bit of history of the, the video game industry. Um, about every 10 years or so, there's a pretty big sea change in terms of monetization. And it seems like we're coming up on that again. And the reason is, there's actually three reasons. Um, but free to play is, is fundamentally broken. Um, and I know that might be a little shocking for people to hear. Who's in the video game industry? Raise your hand. Got it. So not, not too many. But um, even if you're in the video game industry, a lot, of, a lot of people don't necessarily know this aspect yet. Um, and this is happening for, for three big reasons. Number one. Uh, post IDFA, that's identifiers for advertisers. Uh, it was the Apple privacy change that happened a couple of years ago. It's starting to come into effect now. It's really affecting the, the user acquisition costs around the entire space. This is also happening on Google um, coming up, so it's going to be across pretty much everything. And because of that, uh, user acquisition costs are rapidly rising, um, and the models that were typically working previously are no longer working. A game typically spends 50 to 70% of their operating revenue on user acquisition. So if those costs rise, it's actually a really big deal. Number two, 
a lot of these games over the last decade were built in a low interest rate environment. And that's a really big change because money isn't cheap anymore. So you can't really be pushing off these loans for longer and longer because it doesn't actually work. So a lot of free-to-play was dealing with like single percentages on their, on their margins. And so with this big interest rate change, like that's going to put a really big dent in it. A lot of the models are going to break. And then the third one, uh, the third piece is a lot of these games uh, are often 10-year games now. You see Candy Crush in the App Store still topping charts, right? That, that game is over 10 years old. And so if you're a new entrant, you're going to have to fight against all those other big, big players. And it's hard to do that if you don't really have a brand. And so the industry really needs a new type of monetization model. And I personally think that Web3 is, is that. Um, and it's interesting to see all the different vectors that we're going to approach it at. Um, so keep that in the back of your mind as you're listening to these, these new types of models. The video game industry really does need it. So one thing I've, I agree with all three of your points, it's very interesting. And one thing to take note of is that these macro models and these economic models can change. We talk a lot about user acquisition and the cost of user acquisition is rising. That's why we give out tokens because it's a lot cheaper to produce tokens. But at the same time, when we, user acquisition is just one piece of the pie. There's user retention at the same time. And because everyone is giving out tokens for user acquisition, it lowers the barrier of entry and makes it so easy to come and compete in the game or compete in this user attention aspect. So we need to start shifting. When we think about reward system, we think about sustainability, when we think about economic models, it's not just about giving away tokens for user acquisition, but how do you turn these users that you have acquired into user retention? What are the different incentive models? What are the different, maybe not microtransactions, but maybe staking? A lot of people are moving towards staking, and staking is it's kind of like user, uh, microtransactions, because microtransactions has a, a, like explicit cost to continuing the game. But when you talk about staking, this is the opportunity cost of you extracting this value and using it in another system. So at the end of the day, it's all about retention in different ways, different forms, new mechanism design, new token model, and all these different aspects. And I think that's fascinating. Yeah, I, um, I wish we had more time to talk about user acquisition because that is such a selling point for Web3 integrating with uh, even a lot of game publishers that we talk to. It's such a big point that actually I think is not hammered in enough. Uh, there's so much you can do with user acquisition with Web3. Uh, assets and, and different uh, integrations of different products. Um, but I do want to shift topics to a little bit more about like, you know, what does it actually mean to create a sustainable game economy? I think that's the, you know, gist of the panel. I want to make sure we hammer that in because um, this is a big, big thing that's been evolving over the past year and a half. We've seen so many different models come out, some that, um, you know, are kind of interesting, some that have failed, uh, some that are, you know, proposing new, new mechanisms. And so what I want to maybe just start off with, just to, just to maybe get everyone on the same page, is it a two token model, one token model, multiple tokens? What, what, what is it? Which, which one do we go with? What's actually the right approach? I don't know what you guys' thoughts on that. Yeah, I'll, I'll kick this off. I think with a, a good definition of what is sustainability. <laughs> um, for something to be sustainable, it needs to be taking more money in than it's paying out. And I think that's a, a big misconception in the space. There's a lot of ideas that if you design a token, it's free money. You can just give it out. And while you can do that, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot. Because if somebody is given a liquid token and there's liquidity that they can swap with in an AMM, they can run away with the money immediately. right? And so that's kind of a big issue when you're thinking about sustainability. You don't necessarily want to just be giving out tokens to anybody. And Going back to what Lisa was saying, like staking opportunity cost. Uh, what is the opportunity cost of putting the money back into the game versus walking away with it? And I think the answer is in answering that question. Yeah, I think uh, at least from our perspective at Shrapnel, it's you have as many tokens as you need. Um, like the, the way we think about it is each sub-economy deserves its own either non-fungible or fungible token uh, so that you can actually disconnect and replug them back in and, and fix the systems individually, as opposed to having, if one breaks, the whole system breaks, which is kind of what you get if you have one token. Um, for example, with Axie, you had a kind of runaway effect where things just started to break, and they couldn't unplug the part of the system that they needed to unplug. Uh, so at least when we're thinking about it, it's as many as you need. Every single uh, unique economy, whether it's you know the gear in your game, whether it's the actual gold in the game, like all of that should be completely separate. Uh, and its own individual token. So we also believe in a multi-token approach, obviously. Uh, and I think, too, when you talk about one token versus many tokens, there is also a differentiate, uh, difference between uh, 
I'm, what I like to refer to as minor tokens uh, versus power tokens, for example. So, you know, if you look at DeFi kingdoms, we have essentially three primary tokens, and then we have, I don't know, over a hundred tokens in the game because every item is either an NFT or, or a token, like everything in the game is. That's what makes it an open economy. That's what gives everything that value. But then we also have our three primary tokens, uh, and that's where I think it all comes down to the purpose of those tokens. And I do think that, as Francis was saying, there's security in multiple tokens. So the way that we've divided it is we have one token that essentially rec uh, represents the protocol as a whole. It's our gas token on our subnet, it's our primary staking token, that token represents the entirety of the protocol. And then we have two what we call power tokens, and those are individual for the realms that we have as because we're a cross-chain game. The utility of those tokens is identical, but what it does is it allows you to differentiate two players which realm you're in as well as offer reverse benefits so if you're in the more popular realm you're going to see more benefit to that token but the main benefit of doing a system like that is it also really helps with barrier of entry uh, the gameplay tokens being able to have a price of their own separate from the token that represents the protocol allows you to separate those things and say if you really believe in the protocol you believe in what we're building you know you believe in where it's going you buy this token but the demand of that token does not inflate the gameplay price therefore preventing other people from entering because of that inflated price so I'll add on to, in two points, one is talking about tokens, both Francis and Bolon talk about tokens, and the second thing is how do we design a macro model that actually works. So when we talk about tokens, it's not just about one token, two token, and token model. When we talk about tokens, what is tokens in the first place? Tokens are a representation of value, this intrinsic value that's created when you're participating in the system. And you know, why you hold euros? You can hold euros because you get to spend it within the EU region. So when we talk about tokens, there are three key types of tokens. You have non-tradable tokens, and these are still tokens. These are capturing intrinsic value in your system. It could be sellable tokens, it could be reputation tokens. The second kind of tokens are your fungible tokens, your currency-like tokens to facilitate any transactions. A lot of the things that you talk about, like minor tokens. And the third kind of tokens are your NFTs. And these NFTs are a representation of whatever kind of assets that you have in the space. Just because one token exists doesn't doesn't remove the, the existence of the other tokens. You can have a lot of different kind of tokens in the space because you have a lot of different kind of intrinsic value generated in the system. Now let's take a step back and we talk about sustainable economy and sustainable, sustainable model. Sustainable economy is not just about creating an, a token that, that works. It's not just creating a currency token in your game because you have hard currencies and soft currencies in the first place. When we talk about creating sustainable economies, we create, the, we create it in three different pillars, from macro to micro. The first pillar is your market design, understanding what, is, what are the parameters in your market. It's almost like designing a brand new country again. Who are your economic agents? What are the economic, what are the economic pathways, transactional pathways in there? What are the constraints that people should do and should not do within the system? So defining the market, really understanding market structure from an economics perspective. The second thing is mechanism design. Once you attract these people in, we talk about user acquisition, they come into the space, they need to follow some rules. These are mechanism design, the incentive mechanism for them to behave and work within the system. What can they do? What can they not do? What are the behaviors we want to incentivize? What are the rules of the game? What's the governance rules, the transaction rules? How do you swap between the intrinsic value to the extrinsic value, which is secondary market prices that you can sell these assets at? And then finally, we talk about tokens, the token design. So, we talk about the three types of tokens in place, or even more, it doesn't matter, because you can have up to N tokens, and you need to design these tokens. So these tokens, these assets are created, were defined by us, they're created from nothing. We created them from scratch. They're all code, but these, there are rules that these tokens need to abide by. So we talk about market. What are the rules that market needs to abide by, the macro structure? Then the people in, in this space, the incentive mechanisms, the rules that people need to abide by, and then the tokens, because they're all trading an asset, they're all trading this value, these tokens, and what are the rules tokens need to abide by. And then when we talk about sustainability, last point, we talk about two points, zero to one and one to 100. Zero to one is where you go to market, you get product market fit, you get user acquisition. And when we talk about creating a sustainable token then, it's still based on a lot of simulation because we don't have live data yet. And then when we go from one to 100, this is where live ops come in. You don't do purely simulation. You take a lot of market data, and thankfully, everything in Web3 is all public. And this is the biggest difference between Web2 and Web3 games. Because in Web2 games, a lot of data is private. It's all on private servers. You can't just extract the, 
the data to analyze. But here you can extract the data from your competitors to understand, okay, this is what the retention rate of users are in the secondary market or with the NFTs, and this is how we are competing with this market. And how can we update our mechanisms? How, how do we update our incentive design? And so web, when we talk about open market again, it's not just about competing with the attention of the current users, but how do we compete them in the entire macro industry overall? I'm gonna yeah, go jump ahead. in really quick. I'm gonna get a little spicy here, and uh, I'm gonna disagree with some of the people on the panel. So I, I actually don't necessarily agree with a, a two-token or multi-token model. NFTs, sure, I consider that its own separate thing because they're non-fungible. Um, but I prefer one-token models, and here's the reason. If you've got more than one fungible token, you have to support each of those other tokens. And it's very easy uh, for how there to be contagion across all of these other tokens. So I actually would disagree that they're compartmentalized. I think what we've seen in the market is that when one drags down, the others drag down, especially when things are priced in that other token. Um, and going back to the opportunity cost point, um, you know, the, the further you go into different tokens into the, the crypto ecosystems, the further along the risk curve you're actually going because it's less risky to stay in ETH or USDC than it is to stay in, say, a gaming token or the nth gaming token that you're supporting. And so there really has to be a locked solid reason why each one of those tokens needs to be a fungible token and not maybe just a soft currency or a premium currency with a one-way transaction bridge. You know, I th oh yeah, go ahead, go ahead. So, <laughs> I love panels this way because instead of just one person's ideas, you get to fire off with each other. So I agree with you. I think there are a lot of contagion effects. At the same time, when you go back to economics, the first principles really matter. And there are two key differences which I see where two token models or n-token models could exist. The first one is a token used as a medium of exchange, and the second is a token used as a store of value, a form of store of value, which doesn't have to be NFT. And the, because these first principles are so different, the incentive, the behaviors we want to incentivize are different. When we have a store of value, in general, you want people to be holding these tokens. You want them to be staking. You want, them, you want to increase the opportunity cost of selling them right now because they are supposed to accrue value in the long run. Whereas when it comes to a currency token, what you want to incentivize is more velocity, more exchange of hands. And when you have these two opposing factors, two opposing behaviors you want to incentivize, one is people holding the tokens and one is people using the tokens more often, then the mechanism design, the incentive mechanism will be quite different. How do you see that? Yeah, um, I'm curious if you're going to make a token that is medium exchange that has a more stable value, it's meant not to accrue, why not just use a stable coin? Yeah, so I think, I think there's a lot of really interesting, this is actually, we're at like this really interesting point where there's been so many different models uh, out there, and I would say no model has proven yet to be the winner, and that will happen soon. Now, I think the ultimate issue that is trying to be solved is volatility, right? Like, um, the last thing you want is crazy uh, changes in price, you want healthy growth of the open game economy. Uh, you know, there's basic things I think that, um, you know, uh, we agree on. There needs to be utility for the token. There needs to be, uh, you know, proper inflation. But what are like, uh, maybe like basic things that you guys agree with that are needed? Like when you're thinking about advising teams or when you're building your game, what, what's like a primitive that you're like, oh, this is a must when we're building the game. So, you know, I think with one interesting thing with Avalanche subnets, right? You have uh, your own gas token, and that's been a big drawing factor for a lot of games. Building on subnets is that you can use your game token as a gas token. That's like one check. It's like, yes, okay, I can have my own game token as a gas token. What are some things, that's just one example, what are some things that maybe when you're you know, building your game or you're thinking about advising teams or talking to teams, what's like one thing that like, you're like, oh, it has to be X? Um, it sounded like it was a one token model for you. Is there anything else that maybe comes up or uh, any, anything from, uh, from your other? I wouldn't say it necessarily needs to be a one token model. If it's gonna be a two or multi, each one of those has to have a very specific purpose and reason why they have to be an openly traded fungible token that is just on the market. Um, in terms of something that I think is absolutely necessary, you need to answer the question why, why does the token actually matter? Like, why not just do a Web2 game? And I think the answer to that um, is to have people that are cheerleading you on uh, throughout the entire experience. You know, you want to get your, your earliest adopters to be excited about it, your 10,000 earliest fans that are cheering you on that are most committed. Um, let's put it another way. There's about 10,000 games that launch every single year. You won't hear about 99% of them. 
right? And the same problem is going to happen in Web3 games. Like, that's not going to be a novel thing. But how do you find the right ones, or how do you find the ones that you like the most? And I think from a UA perspective, this is an opportunity to use a token to get people excited about the fact that, hey, you know, this is something that we can grow with. This is something that I really like. And if it does take off, well, hey, you know, there's, there's upside in that. Yeah. Uh I mean, from my perspective, the must-have is utility. I mean, ultimately, that's what it boils down to, is if you're making a token, that token should have a purpose. Uh, but I do think that the goal behind tokenizing more things in games specifically is to encourage that open economy and to have more trading. Uh, so, you know, if you look at a game like World of Warcraft, which we talked about earlier, but that's it, obviously <laughs> probably the most universally accept, uh, accessible example, if you look at a, a world or a game like world of warcraft they have an auction house right and you can go in that auction house and you can buy whatever materials you need for whatever it is you're trying to do you can buy rare equipment you can buy anything in the game but all of those as tokens free them for easier and more direct trade between players as well as building their intrinsic value into the item itself by having it be a token, as well as just utilizing blockchain tech to be able to track supply very easily, to be able to improve randomness on the mint chances of that item uh, during whatever is eligible for it. Uh, so I think that's one of the main incentives in games of tokenizing more items is to be able to use that blockchain technology to take it to the next level. Yeah, I think the, you, you saw it a lot in the early days with a lot of people locking uh, prices of their assets in game to like, the actual token itself as opposed to user demand. So I think for, at least in, in my head, one of the key things that you have to do is let it be based off user demand. Like the, the first principle that you have to look at if you have an open economy is not say, hey, we're setting the prices and the prices are going to be this. It's like a, 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 a nice little dance between uh, retention of keeping the players in, and then also the demand for the players and how they perceive the can assets. I, can I play off that, actually? Yeah, sure. Yeah. All right, so uh, I, I think the concept around supply is just a really interesting bit, because really it is all about demand. Like, if you don't have demand, supply doesn't even matter. Like, price is a function of supply to demand. Like, you can have a supply of one token, a single token instead of 10 billion, right? But if the demand is there, maybe that token can be you know, cut down into a bunch of decimals, right? And then the price would reflect that, that aspect. So supply doesn't actually matter too much. It really is all about demand. And how do you capture that demand and quantify it and relate the supply to what you want the demand to be? So I agree with everyone. I think when it comes to the Web3 economy, it's all about creating the demand through intrinsic value that Bolon mentioned, because supply is something that we can fix, we can design. We are almost like the developers of this new country that we are creating. And so what does that mean? The thing that we look a lot at is economic risk. Everyone thinks of three kinds of risks. The regulatory risks, which is very important that we have no control of, sadly. We have the financial risks that a lot of people are creating comp complicated financial models, simulations, which is very important. But that, that also assumes a lot of intrinsic demand. So you can fix the supply side, but that kind of financial simulation has some limitations to that. And the third risk will be the technical risks that you know, we can control, we can do a lot of different audits on that. But when we look at economic risks, one of the key things that we also look at is understanding if we, use, if we focus a lot on UA and giving out tokens or NFTs to capture our first markets, one of the important things that we always think about is how does that translate to rent-seeking and create an economy focusing on just rent-seeking? Because if you are only incentivizing and giving, giving benefits to your first early adopters, who else will want to join the game in the long run? You can create the best game, best economy, best intrinsic demand. But because all new other players coming in will never catch up to the first users, the first 1,000 users, because say, I, XE has changed things a lot, but XE's old model was only incentivizing the landowners of XE like two years ago. And that was un unfairly benefiting the early adopters. So when we talk about incentives, when we talk about economic structure, when we talk about sustainable economy, it's about understanding what, what kind of tertiary impact that this incentive that we're creating will impact on the behaviors of users in the long run. And I think that is something that not many people think about, because also not many people think that these games will last for 10 years. So I, um, I just actually want to round this out, because it's a very interesting, there's been a lot of interesting things, but one common theme I think I found was um, this notion of demand, and what does that actually mean to create demand in Web3 games? I think there's a lot of interesting products that I've been seeing 
to help facilitate demand. Um, UGC, right? I mean, you guys definitely know UGC, user-generated content. That's been a really big thing happening with uh, um, open game economies, wagering products. I mean, like, what are some things that you guys are excited about in terms of products that you think will drive demand with Web3 that Web2 models weren't able to deliver? Um, I'll, I want to start with that, and then I'll, I'll have a follow-up to that. But I, what, are, what are some interesting products that you guys are seeing? So let me just begin first. And I don't come from a product perspective, I come from an economics perspective. And we created this new incentive mechanism where we tie the fungible token with the NFT in the space. And one of the reasons we did that is because we have to deal with a lot of lawyers. We deal with a lot of general counsel of all the different companies we work with, and they keep telling us these tokens doesn't work because it comes to security. And that's a big problem. So one thing that we've, a lot of people create fungible tokens. Why we need fungible tokens? Because they're all raising funds. And so you can't raise funds if it becomes a security, it becomes a risk. So what we've done in the high, very, very high level is that you take the fungible tokens and you use the fungible tokens to buy an NFT. Let's say you want to buy a cap. This game requires you to buy a cap. And the cap costs two, two US dollars. So a user can pay two US dollars, of which one dollar goes into the treasury for operating costs because it's very expensive to run a game. And then the other one dollar goes to buy that fungible token off the market. It is not to sell, but it's to keep into, in this pool. And now the head, the cap, is backed by one US dollar and one dollar worth of fungible tokens. That's the very high level, and we can go into details if you want later of what happens when tokens go up or tokens go down in prices. But the whole idea is that it, it creates a price ceiling to the NFT, so you reduce speculation. At the same time, it creates utility of the tokens, and it creates utility of the fungible tokens to reduce the demand outside without the whole buyback and burn kind of mechanism, which helps with the regulatory part. I think the product that I'm most excited for that I think could really do a lot of good for Web3 is regulatory clarity. But, uh, when, <laughs> yeah, short of getting that. Uh, no, I think there's a lot of really cool opportunities and, and really interesting models for uh, lending and especially NFT-based lending, which I think will be a new thing to really start progressing. Uh, but I do think they'll be held back by lack of regulatory clarity for a while, but I think there's a lot of potential there. Yeah, I think uh, bouncing back off something that Nick mentioned earlier, that like, you know, free to play is fundamentally broken. I think UGC is one of the things that becomes that unique thing that brings people into this space where you can actually earn value from uh, producing content for the game. Uh, you get a lot more uh, retention out of that. People stay in the ecosystem. Content constantly feels fresh and it reduces a lot of the costs of development if you have the tools to allow players to develop content uh, themselves. Like you, you look at, uh, an easy example is you know, CSGO. That was created from Half-Life. Uh, games like uh, Call of Duty, World at War, actually lived on for a very long time with custom zombies maps. Uh, giving the players the chance, chance to create that massively reduces cost on our side, uh, but also like, you get that 10-year game effect and you can live a lot longer with a much smaller player base because they're so invested in the actual game itself, and then they spend more money because that's effectively what it's all about, increasing the, the li lifetime value of the player. With every change in monetization structure in the video game industry, you get different games that are developed. So with arcades, it was pay to play, right? They were really hard games because it was meant to churn you, right? With premium games that you purchase for a single price, you get these really long, cool narrative games because you're selling on the premise of the narrative. With free-to-play, you get games that are constantly popping ads in your face because they're trying to get one out of 1,000 people to monetize. And when they do, they're going to continue doing it because it's objectively better, right? Um, with crypto and with blockchain games, I think we're going to see different types of game mechanics emerge that work really well with the monetization structure. And I'm going to echo that. UGC is going to be one of those things. Like network effects is one of the big factors for you know, crypto adoption. It's you know, what spurred a lot of um, you know, the excitement around crypto in the first place. So I think that's going to be a good one. I think time duration is an interesting mechanic to play with. Um, we haven't had games where you're really uh, managing time as an aspect of a mechanic. I'm sure there's like 4X games that use like time as a progression mechanic, but I don't think we've really captured what it means to have somebody excited about a game for a week at a time, and they run seasons that are like seasonal about that. And it's like you know weekly tournaments, for example. Um, I think that's an interesting one. Uh, and also real-time risk management. I think that's another aspect that we haven't really needed to crack before in game design. Um, maybe you get a little bit of it like with roguelites, but 
you know, I think crypto pushes it into a, a new field because there's, you know, actual stakes on the line. Um, so I'd say that, you know, those three, there's a lot of others, but, you know, I'm excited to see what new games develop because of those new incentivization mechanics. Yeah, I, I'm, I, so I'm, I think uh, we're running out of time, but I think the biggest thing uh, I kind of learned on this panel is, um, right, like, you ha yes, you want to solve for volatility, uh, but in, in order to actually solve any of the problems with like, yeah, do we have two tokens, one token, three tokens, um, you know, it's really about like the utility, right, to create sustainability for the gaming ecosystem. It has to be organic for utility as well. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of interesting use cases that you're seeing out there that you guys mentioned. Uh, lending, I think, is fantastic. UGC, uh, you know, anything to help create, um, you know, really real demand for these assets is a big component. And, uh, and then how you structure that, of course, is another big component. Uh, and I think, um, you know, it will be, t you know, TBD, is it a one token model? Do you stable coins, two token model? Uh, but the inherent truth is that you do need to apply true utility and products that drive organic growth. Um, I think we're, we're out of time, but that is it for the gaming tokenomics panel. Uh, thank you so much for everyone coming up. And uh, yeah, yeah, thank you for coming, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Have a great summit.